Hi everybody, um, welcome. If you've not met me before, I'm Deborah Young and I'm the CEO of the RegTech Association and we're really, really happy to have you here today for our RegTech Open for Business uh, Venture Credit What's That? Um, I'd like to start our meeting this morning, if I may, with an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to pay my respects to, to the traditional owners of the land uh, that we are meeting on today across Australia pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Thank you so much and a big warm welcome um, to everyone here. Um, this RegTech Open for Business series we developed um, uh, somewhat uh, hastily 12 weeks ago as we uh, went into lockdown with uh, COVID-19 and we recognised the need that there would be from our membership um, for support, for information and for tools to help people make uh, good decisions um, as we navigate our way through the crisis and as we are starting to see um, uh, some emerge, uh, emergence of recovery and going back to normality. Um, and, and we felt it very important to run these sessions to support everybody through this time. And, um, what we didn't anticipate was probably the sheer size and breadth and um, variety of people that would come. And we've had something like 2,000 people from 30 countries um, over the past 12 weeks. And I think we only had 1,000 people altogether in the whole of last year. So that gives you some idea about the, the keen interest um, that there is in uh, not only RegTech, um, but also helping uh, people navigate their way through. Um, so I've just got a couple of um, housekeeping things uh, before we kick off, if, if you don't mind. If everybody could, uh, with the exception of the uh, person who's speaking, could put themselves on mute and perhaps turn their camera off. We just uh, want to try and preserve um, uh, the technical uh, things if we can. Um, and what we're going to do today is use the chat function uh, to curate the questions. I've already popped something up there. So that's what you'll use to make your question. And if you would be so kind as to identify yourself with your question, because sometimes uh, the names don't come up properly. So if you just want to say that it's uh, John uh, from Telstra, for example, um, you could do that and that, that helps uh, put the question in context uh, for whoever is answering that. Uh, that would be great. A recording will be, um, is being made of this session and will be made available um, afterwards. Um, so I'm um, super pleased uh, to be able to invite um, what are some new faces, but an organisation that I'm very familiar with. Um, so um, our uh, presenters today come from One Ventures, who for those of you who will know are a venture capital uh, firm. And I've known um, Michelle Deeker, Anne-Marie and Paul Kelly for many years um, from my old days when I worked at AVCAL or then now known as the Australian Investment Council. Uh, so I've worked with them over um, many years. And so it was very pleasing uh, for me to reconnect with the team um, to bring you this program today all about venture credit um, so what, uh, just by way of structure, what um, we're going to do now is I'm, I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker, which is Nigel Dews, who's a venture partner from One Ventures, and he's going to do a little bit of an introduction piece. Then we're going to hand to Nick Gainsley, who's going to do a Debt 101 for us. And um, then we're going to be joined in a little bit of a Q&A come fireside chat with James, Nick, and Nigel, and what I'm encouraging us all to do is make this as interactive as possible, post up as many questions as we can, and that will help the whole session to be very, very lively. And then we intend to finish on time at or around 12.55 so you can all get to your one o'clock one o'clock meetings. Um, so I'm going to um, introduce you to Nigel now. Nigel is a venture partner at One Ventures and is primarily focused on the firm's digital and technology-based portfolio businesses. His experience encompasses over 16 years in leadership roles, often leading high growth startups and nine years in strategy consulting. Nigel has been a leader in the digital media, technology and telco industries, such as the C CEO of Vodafone Hutchison Australia, 3Mobile and the first chief, chief executive of the Fairfax Media Digital Business. Most recently, Nigel was CEO of Melbourne-based technology scale-up 
message media, leading the strategy development and execution to rapidly grow via acquisitions, new products, and geographic expansion. Uh, it's my great pleasure to invite uh, Nigel to the video. Thanks, Nigel. Thanks very much, Deborah. Um, could we go to the next next slide, please? I'm, I'm just I've got the easy job today of just introducing One Ventures and uh, setting a little bit of context, and then I'll hand over to Nick, who'll uh, take you through uh, the the whole venture credit story. Uh, but first, to give you a little bit of an overview, our uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, One Ventures is really Australia's uh, leading technology and health healthcare VC. Um, it's it, our focus is in those two areas primarily. We've got uh, over 400 million in funds under management, and currently around 22 active portfolio companies. Um, I think what what makes the One Ventures fairly unique is that it's founded by founders, uh, and it is uh, backed by hundreds of high net worths, and that. Being founded by founders it tends to mean it takes a more practical and operational approach uh, to working working side by side with uh, the, the the founders of the businesses. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are, an, are now four uh, funds and then and co investments, and we're we're in the process of raising a fifth fund at the moment. Started way back in 2010, and for those of you that I'm sure remember, that was a really tough uh, period for financial markets in that post-GFC era. And uh, Michelle Dicker and, and fellow partners raised uh, the first fund, and it was around around the time of the, the first emergence, really, of, of venture capital uh, in Australia. Uh, and it was a combination of both uh, uh, early stage tech and healthcare. It was followed fairly quickly by another fund in later stage, uh, healthcare and tech, uh, and then a pure healthcare fund in 2016. Um, and in and, and last year, uh, we began the raising of the, the venture debt uh, or venture credit fund, uh, as, as we know it today. And Nick will obviously talk a lot more about that in a minute. Uh, and we also manage a number of co-investments alongside those funds. Next slide, please. Um, and we've invested in a, 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 a range of Australian healthcare and technology companies. Um, it's diverse as you know, wearables for dementia patients, through to HR management in the cloud, e-learning, uh, virtual communications. Two of these um, uh, companies from our first fund uh, we've now uh, exited. One of those is Smart, uh, Smart Sparrow, and the other we exited last week. Actually, uh, it's a company called Ovo down in the down the bottom right hand corner of that slide, a uh, left hand corner of that slide. Sorry, uh, and it's uh, uh, and we sold that to Amazon. So. You know, very important as venture capitalists to not only be able to invest, but also to be able to exit businesses successfully. The next slide, please. Um, this is the team. It's uh, some, uh, I think we're 18 people now, um, led very much by by our partners, Michelle Dicker, uh, Paul Kelly, uh, Anne-Marie and Grant. And, um, uh, and we have a wealth of really good advisors um, venture partners, investment principles, and we'll talk a little bit more about the team actually on the venture credit uh, fund in a moment. Next slide, please. So this is the venture credit team. Uh, Nick, who you're about to meet, um, has got a wealth of debt experience. He's got, uh, he had, um, you know, seven years in debt advisory and then six years at, at Kuros Capital, which is the EU's largest venture fund. Uh, and Bring, brought enormous experience to us when we were establishing what was effectively the first venture credit fund in Australia. And James, James, who you'll also meet on the panel, uh, also has a very extensive financial markets background, debt advisory, and uh, has been at uh, One Ventures for four years. Um, and that's supported, of course, um, by the, the rest of the talent in the team. And I think one of the one of the things that certainly makes uh, Michelle a, a standout. Uh, uh, and very practical venture capitalist is her own experience with two successful um, uh, startup businesses and exits, and uh, so and that ability to have great empathy with our with our uh, invest, invested companies is very important. Um, in fact, that's actually where I met uh, Michelle the first time when she was uh, was with with her very first startup. Uh, she was selling her wares to Fairfax uh, Fairfax Digital when I was there. 
Um, importantly, sitting alongside the uh, venture credit teams are our, our partners at Viola, it's, which is a very large uh, venture credit fund from Israel. Uh, and it, they, they bring a wealth of expertise to supplement Nick and the team. And without any further words, I think I'll just pass over to Nick and he can introduce himself and the team. Hi, thanks, Nigel. Uh, thanks, Deborah. So, yeah, really the purpose of today is we want to give you a background on first few slides really on debt specifically and then more around venture credit and what the product is and how we're um, looking to help businesses in Australia. So just just touching upon my background there, which, which Nigel helped me gave is, you know, I moved across from the UK a year ago to head up a venture credit fund at One Ventures. Um, the previous fund I was at is the largest player doing this in Europe. It's been around in Europe for about 20 years. Uh, concept originally started in the Silicon Valley probably 30, 40 years ago. Originally, it started funding uh, equipment in rollout of semiconductor fabs. So it's really it's very hard to get uh, finance into finance specific pieces of equipment. And so this, this, this product evolved. Since then, it's evolved from specifically funding kind of fit outs and rollouts into wider operational funding for high growth technology businesses. So uh, I probably worked on nearly 100 transactions across Europe. So this first slide here just talks about just the key differences between, between debt and equity. I know most of you on the call probably know this already, but some have a different understanding than others. But really just, just, just highlighting this really is around, firstly, the risk of the of this different security and investment um, products and the return profile. So the first piece here is just looking at the return or the cost to the companies. Obviously, equity is, is always more expensive than debt because as a, a shareholder, you're taking on more risk, so you demand a higher return. Uh, and you're different in terms of seniority. So from an equity perspective, you're junior to, to lenders uh, and debt. Uh, and in exchange, you get your return through dividends and capital appreciation, whereas a lender would get their returns through interest and fees, um, maybe have some exposure to the equity. And I'll come on to that specifically around venture credit. Um, so because of that dynamic, equity effectively is, is an unlimited upside, but also uncertain upside, whereas from a debt perspective, you have a fixed contractual return uh, and returns are normally capped. Uh, venture credit is slightly different because there's also some exposure to the equity through the warrants. And I'll come on to that. And that's really an equity option. Given the different dynamics, voting is key as well. So as a shareholder, obviously, you have voting rights. As a lender, you don't. Um, and then from a company perspective, because of the contractual nature of, of uh, returns, debt is higher risk to the company because if you don't make those repayments, you default on your loan. With equity, there's no fixed returns. So you can't, in theory, default on it. Uh, the last strap line here, if you can see it in the orange, um, is really just mentioning the tax deductibility of, of debt. So if you're a profitable business, then you can also pay your interest before paying tax. It's actually advantageous. Uh, if you're an early stage technology business, you're probably still loss making, and so it doesn't actually impact you uh, straight away. Need to go to the next slide, please. And this is just an example here of, of the leverage effect. So what we're trying to show here is just a really, really simple example. Let's say you had a million dollars and you wanted to invest in property, you can invest all of that and fully fund it with equity, or you could choose to take you know, bank debt and uh, get a mortgage. So the example here is on the left, you fully fund a single property, 100% equity. On the right, you're funding 10 properties with 100K of equity in each property and 90% leverage. And the key difference there is if, if the underlying asset moves up and down, on the equity fully funded, you just get a likewise uh, increase or decrease in your value. So if it goes up 10%, you make 10%. If it falls 10%, you lose 10%. However, when you take on a uh, set, you leverage those returns up and down. So in this example here, you take 10 properties. Um, effectively, you're going to get a 10x uh, leverage effect. So if the property goes up, each property goes up 10%, you're going to double your money and make 100% return on the underlying equity piece you put in. Whereas it falls, you actually magnify your losses as well. So it, it works on the upside and the downside. Um, next slide, please. This here just shows to look at different types of facilities, and really this is the nature of the repayment profile and drawdown profile. So the top left there is a, is a term loan, so you take the money out for a fixed period of time, but you're paying it back in a single piece. So it's like a bullet, like a single shot. Um, the bottom one is, is also a term debt, so you're taking the money over a similar time period, but you're paying down that debt over the period, so it's amortizers uh, as you pay down the capital. So that, that's more similar to how venture credit works, actually. On the right are the two examples of facilities which are up and down over, over the life. Uh, a revolving credit facility or an RCF is used in more mature businesses um, and many corporates. 
you'll see I've taken this sort of product. What it allows you to do is take down the money in lots of small term loans effectively. So you'll borrow that money for anywhere from a matter of weeks up to probably six months, probably the longest. Um, and what you do is you pay the interest and the capital back after that period, and then you can draw down again. But you may be able to draw down in multiple pieces at the same time. So you have kind of that step function, uh, often can be used for working capital and managing your business uh, through, through the year. Uh, and overdraft is similar in it going up and down, but it goes up normally on a kind of continual basis. Um, advantageous in that you're only paying interest for the period you take the money, but normally overdrafts are not committed facilities. And what I mean by that is someone will lend it to you, but it can always be cancelled at any point in time. So because of that, it may be cheaper, it has lower capital requirements for banks, but it's something you shouldn't fully fund your business and rely on it. It's more a way of managing short-term working capital movements. Let me just move to the next slide. What we're now going to cover off is specifically venture credit. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, just, just drop them in the chat and we can um, we can answer them at the end of the fireside chat. So what, what is venture credit? Really what it is is a flexible form of debt, specifically targeted high growth businesses and normally high growth technology businesses. And we're targeting businesses which either couldn't access traditional debt funding uh, from banks or they're choosing to take a form of funding which is more flexible than a bank may provide. Now that may be maybe in, in terms of amount, but it's also around restrictions in business and requirements as you move through that loan and life of that loan. Um, with the case of venture credit, given that, often it's being provided to businesses which are still pre-profit and choosing, choosing to trade off profitability for growth. So they're still cash burning, but it also can be used for kind of low profitable businesses which haven't got many years of stable, stable uh, profits. And the money can be spent like equity. And what I mean by that is effectively there's not restrictions, but it must be used for this sort of um, this use case. It can fund all sorts of things. It can cut fund uh, sales and marketing teams. It can fund international expansion. It can fund CapEx and R&D. It can fund acquisitions. So very, very flexible. Um, it's cheaper than using equity uh, and it's much less dilutive. So for businesses where you're moving through that traditional VC funding round, route, you'll take you know, multiple rounds of funding as you go along. Being able to blend debt and equity into those funding rounds and potentially take more money at each round, what you can do is you can delay the next round. So the table on the, the graph on the right shows the black line is purely funding with equity. If you factor in debt as well, we're moving on that blue path. So effectively you move further before you raise money. You may even move and achieve more milestones before you raise again. Maybe you reach a certain scale, which means you access new types of investors or become, you know, attractive from an international perspective, um, maybe you prove out a product, prove out a market, you then get a higher step up in your valuation. And as you move forward, effectively, you'll go further and create more value by using debt and equity. And from a funding it that way rather than pure equity, you're saving dilution as you go along. So it really improves those underlying returns for existing shareholders, much like the house example before. Could you go to the next slide, please? So different, different use cases for, for venture credit. Um, one is, is if you reduce, you're reducing dilution during an equity round. So if you knew you were raising a certain amount of money, let's say you raised $5 million. If you took some of that as equity, some as debt, you're reducing the dilution of the overall round. Um, it could be used between rounds where you haven't quite achieved what you need to get that next financing round away. Uh, particularly attractive in this current market where things take longer, maybe growth has slowed because of slowing in, in consumer or business demand. And therefore having that availability of funds to go further and then achieve your, your targets is really valuable. Um, it can completely replace equity further down the track where you've raised equity funding, you don't need that much, or the business is stable enough that it can take on a large amount of debt and you can replace equity. And the last point there on the insurance policy, what I mean by that is the facility can be available to take um, at the discretion of the, of the company um, if you need the money. So effectively, let's say that Coming back to the example before where things are taking longer, maybe your cost base isn't what you thought it was, maybe your revenue is not as high as it was. Because of that, you need more money to get to the next, next goal and you choose to take it down. So it kind of acts like insurance. It can be through good and bad. You may see more investment opportunities and want to invest harder and having availability of funds is, is really, really valuable. If you just jump to the next slide, please. So why raise venture debt, venture credit? Uh, versus equity. Of course, there's pros and cons with, with everything. You know, it's not everything great, no downsides. So just running through kind of positives and negatives. Um, and I've touched upon a number of these already. So you, you avoid dilution. 
Um, important one here is you're not changing your board. So often, as you already know, when you raise um, private venture capital rounds on the equity side, those new investors who come on, if they're, if they're taking quite a large stake in your business, they'll require a board seat as well. So as you grow, you may be giving up board seats to more and more parties. And so you slowly start to lose control as a founder um, and have more people directing and having a view. You may not want this. So having a product like, like what One Ventures offer, we don't need to take a board seat. We're not, we're not telling you what to do. We're not taking voting rights. Um, it's cheaper than equity. So it's overall brings down your cost of capital. Um, the next one in terms of avoiding pricing around is really important. So as a lender, irrespective of the fact we take an, an equity option through the warrants, and I'll talk a bit about that further on, we're not setting um, a valuation. So maybe you're at a time when you're not quite ready to set a valuation and you may not achieve what you want. Perhaps you've declined because of the current market and you may have a down round and you want to avoid that. So by taking on a product like this, you avoid that pricing. So that's a really, really important piece and especially important in the current market when valuations are a bit more uncertain. Um, you may, depending on who you take a product like this from, bring a new venture investor on board without, without bringing on that board seat. So one venture is like Nigel mentioned, you know, we're a venture capital firm. We can give guidance uh, to businesses, help them grow, uh, introduce them to people, give them value as an investor without actually giving up a board seat and giving up control. And the last point there, it's far faster to put in place this sort of product than it is to take on equity. Typically, it'll take four to six weeks. An equity round may take three to six months, so much, much quicker. Um, on the cons, the debt will sit senior to equity. Um, so we would ask for our money back first before equity. Uh, and then a waterfall basis because of our security we sit at the top. So just be aware from an equity perspective that someone will be getting their potential money back before them. Uh, obviously, if there's cost, you've got to pay interest through the life of a loan. It doesn't fit every situation, so we may not be able to provide the, the figure you want and you need to supplement it with equity. Potentially, your business isn't quite right for debt. Um, maybe that's not now. Um, as you grow, it will change. And lastly, generally, it's a smaller check than equity. Um, so normally what we see is when we come in alongside a financing round, you'll take some debt, some equity. Usually the debt piece is smaller than the equity piece. And as an overall funding for the business, debt is definitely, well, this product debt, is, is less than you'd get from equity. If you just go to the next slide, please. So I can get asked, well, what does it look like? How is it structured? So what it is, it's a, it's a senior secured loan. So we take security on the business. Uh, we don't look to take director's guarantees, which is different to what banks may ask for early on in the journey. So only, only the business is up for, you know, what, what it's even given up in terms of security. Uh, it's a loan, so you're paying back interest as you go through the loan. Normally it's through equally, equal monthly payments, which include interest and capital. There can be a short period of interest only at the start, but then you pay down that loan in that step amortizing structure like I showed before. Uh, and normally it includes equity options, uh, which are warrants. So what we say there is we have a right to buy shares in the future at a set price on entry. And what we're looking to do there is if the business does well, we help, um, help drive that growth. We want to participate in a little bit of upside at the end. So when you sell the business, uh, we can exercise our warrants and may take a small additional amount of return through the upside. From a covenant perspective, when I say covenant light here, I'm talking really around financial covenants. Generally, it's pretty light. So we're not asking you to hit month on month, set figures every month and be very, very structured. We like to give companies the ability to take money, grow the business as they see fit and really drive value. And that's, that's a big difference to a, a more structured, more mature bank loan. Uh, next slide, please. So from a waterfall ranking perspective, uh, and this applies on any liquidation event. So that can be, you know, you sell the business. How does the, the returns get, get passed to the different stakeholders? Uh, it can also apply if your business gets broken up or in a, in a downside scenario. Effectively, who gets their money back first before it drops to the next level? So debt will always sit above equity, given that that lower risk but lower return uh, requirements. You start off a senior debt, there may be a portion of junior debt, depending on your business, who take a position behind the senior lender. Um, you may be familiar with convertibles and shareholder loans, uh, often used in early stage businesses. That would sit below the debt, but it sits above other equity. You may have pref equity uh, as, you, as you grow your business, which would sit above ordinary equity, and then at the bottom it will be ordinary equity, which is often where founders sit. Uh, next slide, please. From a, from a term perspective, I've kind of tried to give here a snapshot of different terms um, in a typical venture 
uh, venture debt agreement. Um, it can can differ depending on lender, but this gives you a kind of a and and it really does differ depend on company situation and and credit profile. But just give you an understanding of the sorts of uh, terms to expect. From a loan size perspective, this applies to us at One Ventures. We can lend anywhere from about half a million dollars up to about five million dollars. Uh, if we co-invest with our partner Viola, who Nigel mentioned earlier, out in Israel, we've we've looked at things up as high as twenty million of them. Um, as a wider firm, Viola has about three billion US under management, so it's quite a large group. Um, so we can do quite large facilities with them, or we actually co-invest with our LPs as well and do larger check sizes. From a length of loan perspective, typically they're fairly short term. So normally we're lending over a three year period. It can be lower. So we're saying here it can be as low as 12 months, can be a little bit more up to about four years, but generally it's that sort of period. Reason being the businesses are changing very, very quickly and we can only kind of predict up front um, how a company is going to grow and develop uh, so far as the future. So we don't lend over too long a period, but we can often provide follow on loans and grow with a business as they grow and therefore provide further three-year loans into the future. So it, it does, the relationship can last longer than that three-year period. From an interest rate perspective, typically it's low double digits. So it's always going to be kind of north of 10%. Uh, rationale for that is really around the risk profile of those businesses, um, our co own cost of capital and what we what we desire. Uh, other costs to be aware of, you know, there they can be fees to put in place to facility. If the facility is open, uh, but not taken day one, there may be some form of non-utilization fee or availability fee. Um, they're kind of a cost on the loan. There's also obviously the cost from the, the warrants as well. Typically, the warrant piece is hard to size exactly and give you an open view, but we say here somewhere between kind of 1% and 4% of the business if we exercise and became a shareholder. That size will really depend on size of loan, valuation of business, growth profile of business, uh, all of those things together. But that kind of gives you an understanding. It's a very small amount of dilution, but it's not, not completely non-dilutive. Uh, but we have looked at examples as well where there's no warrants whatsoever. If we can, you know, manage the, the wider return profile of a loan to make it work for us. Um, from a repayment perspective, you're paying down the capital over the life of a loan. Um, so you may think, okay, that's going to be expensive from a cash perspective, and it will impact your your burn or your business or your you know your cost base. But ultimately, what we're looking to do there is we're looking to de-risk through the life of a loan, and we don't want to create a refinancing wall where, let's say, three years out, you've suddenly got to pay back five million dollars. Because if you're not generating enough profits to pay that back, you're then going to have to find the money somewhere. And really, the only place you're going to find it is by raising equity capital uh, or potentially finding another lender to refinance. But that creates a bigger risk on the existing shareholders in the company. And so we'd rather not have that, that event in the future. Um, and by having a loan repaid over a period of time, actually, the overall interest you pay from a, from a cash kind of dollar, dollar, dollar by dollar basis will come down as well. Um, the loans are super flexible and they don't really have a set purpose. So like I mentioned before, they, they can be used for lots of different sources of, um, of funding. Um, the other things worth pointing out here from an information perspective, we operate on a very kind of light touch, uh, low admin perspective. We don't take a board seat like I mentioned earlier, but we like to have a board observer. Um, the reason for that is it, it makes our life much easier to really understand the business. So we will come along to the board meetings or, or join by phone. We can add value, but we also get a lot of visibility and transparency on the business. In exchange for that, we don't require set monthly reporting. Uh, we'll take what gets provided to board and how the company uh, reports. So we try to make life easy for, for the um, management team. And the last point there in the bottom right is, as a fund, given we have equity funds and the nature of our fund, we're actually able to invest equity as well into the future. So if there's opportunities whereby um, there's a funding round happen and there's spare capacity in that round which which is available one ventures may be able to invest and, and help become a shareholder and help drive that business forward um, next slide please so what stage do you need to be to access this form of capital so for us what we're looking for is businesses have gone past that initial phase of development they've built some technology they've launched in market they're starting to sell and you're seeing product market fit and so for us to see that, we kind of look for about 3 million uh, minimum revenue. We want to make sure the product's in market and it's, and it's working. So we don't really want to be taking that, that early stage technology risk because ultimately we're not getting the same return as, as equity investors. Um, the next point here around unit economics is really important for us because these businesses are still you know, early stage. What we look at is we look at the underlying metrics of a business and we try and see like how viable is this business? Is it working currently? So things we look for is we'll look at you know, 
how much are you generating per customer, uh, how much does it cost to acquire your customers, you know, what's the, the churn through the life of, um, of a customer, and therefore, you know, how much can you generate over the lifetime, what's the lifetime value? We'll look at LTV to CAC ratios, we'll look at margins, and from that, we'll see, well, if you invest harder in your business, is it going to continue to scale profitably? So that's important. We want to make sure as well that the companies have already raised equity capital. Typically, we look for kind of an institutional investor, um, ideally a VC, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a VC. It could be a corporate investor. Uh, it could be a you know family office or a collection of family offices or high net worths in there. We want to make sure really that there's someone else around the table who's helping advise and provide funding to a business and we're not the only source of capital around the table. Typically, we look for businesses, therefore, which are kind of series A and beyond. Um, the product's really for, for performing businesses which are growing fast. So we look for kind of 30% plus top line growth a year. Normally, businesses are growing 50, 100%. I know given kind of COVID-19, businesses are kind of going through trickier times, so growth may have come down a little bit. But ultimately, the higher growth a business has, the higher the cost of equity, the more attractive a product like ours is. Um, and it's complementary, and this is really the importance of delaying financing rounds is more and more important when you're growing fast. So that's kind of a, a key thing we look for. Um, the last point there, business can be cash burning or profitable. We're not scared by a business which is cash burning. If it's profitable, it doesn't need to be profitable for year after year uh, before we come in. What we do is we really take a holistic view on a business. We look at how does that business look today and how is it going to develop through the life of a loan uh, rather than simply looking backwards. So we'll take a view that the business may need to raise money in the future to continue paying down the loan. And so we'll take a view on whether we feel it's attractive enough to raise money, whether it's if there's an underlying core business which is disruptive and going to be attractive to other investors, um, and long term, whether it's something that can be grown and, and sold in the market. So they're, they're important things we look for. Uh, next slide, please. So from a cost comparison, um, and I said before, you know, venture debt, venture credit is way cheaper than funding via equity. It's actually many multiples cheaper. Um, reason for that is people don't necessarily think of the cost of equity to a business, but actually it's quite a large uh, cost. You know, people who invest and take on shares are looking for a, you know, a good return on their money, um, normally through capital appreciation, but it can be through dividends depending on the nature of the business. And with an early stage high growth business, that cost is, is further exaggerated. So if you give an example, I'll show you an example here, for a 3 million um, funding round, and you have a choice here of funding via a loan or via equity, assuming the loan funds over 36 months with a kind of low double digit interest rate and with that warrant component as well. If you came in here at an entry valuation of 30 million and an exit valuation of 150, so for 3 million, you would take basically 3 over 33, this example I've used here, so 30 is a pre-money. If that then business went and grew to 150 on as an exit, if you fully funded via equity, you would have a overall profits of those shareholders of 10.6 million for that 3 million investment. If you compared that to what it would cost you overall for taking and funding via venture debt, including the warrant piece, it would cost about 1.9 million profit to the, to the lender. So that's about five times cheaper. So quite a big difference in, in the two cost of capital. Um, and obviously that, that saving would go straight back into the pockets of the uh, shareholders on exit. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of venture debt versus other forms of debt, which, which businesses we look at may, may consider, um, convertible notes really I see as a kind of structured form of equity. Normally, if you're taking a convertible note or a safe note, the intention of those lenders is to convert to equity and become a shareholder. And really, they're structuring it because you're not setting the valuation today, and it gives them protection until the point of conversion. Um, typically, it's unsecured. Uh, it's usually very, very flexible. Uh, from a dilution perspective, because it becomes equity, typically around represents about 20% of your equity. So I've shown about 20% dilution there. Uh, there could be a running interest cost. They may not on the convertible. Typically, it's somewhere between kind of 8 to 12%. Um, normally, there's, there's no covenants. And amount-wise, it can be any size. Um, working capital lines are very specific forms of capital where you're funding certain working capital. That may be around your receivable book. It could fund, you can maybe funding inventory or certain fixed assets. Um, a working capital provider, which typically takes the form of a bank or kind of an alternative financer, 
usually will lend at a cheaper rate because they they are lending against that specific asset book. So they really have comfort around uh, the quality of the assets and the ability to recover in an event there's a problem. Normally, size-wise, it's probably smaller than you would get from, from venture debt or other forms of debt. So written here, kind of early stage, it may be kind of sub half a million. It could be a little bit more. Normally, it's revolving, so you usually draw down to fund certain working capital and then pay back. So if you're funding a receivable, maybe a receivable was paid over 30, 60 days, you then draw down again on another, another invoice. Um, on the far right here, something which is which is very new to Australia, but something which you're seeing in other parts of the world, which is kind of a form of royalty-based financing, but it's called revenue-based investing. Um, a lender is willing to lend against your effectively your revenue. So when you're a SaaS business and they're comfortable on quality of, of your SaaS, they may lend a small amount against that. So typically they'll lend two to four times uh, monthly recurring revenue. Normally you'll access a smaller amount of overall capital than you'd get from a product like venture debt. Um, maybe somewhere between half a million to $3 million. Um, you'd pay back on a monthly basis and you'd pay back as a percentage of your revenue as opposed to a fixed interest rate. But if you translate that to an interest rate, you're probably paying somewhere between 15 and 20%. So it's probably a little bit more expensive than a than venture debt. Um, there could be dilution, there can be warrants, there may not be warrants depending on the pricing. Um, it's also secured and, and is, is very flexible. Comparing it, all of those back to venture debt, Venture debt, normally you can access a larger amount of capital, probably somewhere between 10 to 50% of your, of your annual revenue, but there's some flexibility there. Um, it's for loan with your warrant piece, like I mentioned, and I've talked about kind of the interest rate and other pieces, but so typically from a pricing perspective, it'll be more expensive than a convertible and a warrant from an interest cost. Uh, from an overall cost, it's cheaper than a convertible and cheaper than a revenue-based financing. Please go to the next slide, please. So the product isn't isn't fitted for fitting for every type of situation. Now I've kind of touched upon these pieces just to reiterate. So from a size and scale of business, if the business is too early and hasn't yet reached enough scale to prove product market fit and prove it's working, then it's probably not right for for venture debt. Um, if a unit economics are not bottoms out, what I mean by that is they're still not that predictable and are moving around. So maybe you know you're still working on your CAC, your churn may be out of whack. Um, you know, you're not quite sure who you're targeting yet in terms of exact perfect customer fit. And really, I suggest waiting and funding the business via equity. Once you get more predictability around the business, then you're probably better suited to, to taking your money. Um, and also, you need to raise some equity before you look to take on venture debt. And it could be that you're raising a series A and you take some debt, some equity at the same time. So that can be our entry point. From a kind of intentions of funds point here, what I mean about is kind of how are you using the funding? So if you're looking to use the money as a kind of last resort so you're unable to raise equity and you're saying i can't raise equity let's just take some debt to keep this business going the problem is there you're really in a, a scenario where you're not attractive to raise equity and you're probably uh not in the best kind of financial standing or financial position and in those circumstances i wouldn't recommend taking debt because all you're going to do is put a contractual burden to pay interest and capital when the business is still not on a good trajectory and so you're only going to put yourself in a, in a difficult situation also if you're in a turnaround or in a very low growth scenario, I'll be very wary because um, you kind of again want to get you know work out work out how to invest, make your business good standing, high growth before you take on the product. And lenders probably won't lend to you in these situations. Likewise, if you over leverage a business, and what I mean by that is putting in too much debt for the scale of the business, all you're going to do is create a burden on the business from a repayment perspective, and that may really drag the business down, maybe make it attract unattractive to raise further funding, which is a problem. Um, if you have a very, very short runway, so if you're bridging to an equity round, maybe you're saying, look, I'm going to raise an equity round second half of the year, so let's take some debt today. Really, as a lender, we wouldn't be comfortable lending if the runway is very short. You know, if it's a six-month runway and there's a lot of risk on that equity round being successful, then we'd want to get paid much more. So maybe I'd suggest in those circumstances use a, a convertible or a different structure to um, a different form of capital. Uh, if you're fully replacing equity and you can't raise equity, it's kind of the point I made before. And if you're funding a pivot, so if, if you're looking to change direction of your business, be it uh, completely change the product or changing the customer type or or just something's not working and you're changing, again, it's more of a turnaround. And I recommend finding your feet, learning how that's working before taking on further capital. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is something that's often overlooked, but really important is who you're working with. So like who you're taking equity from, it's important that you get along with the people that have the right experiences and they can really help you. So, you know, this product is relatively you know, young and immature in Australia. There's not many people doing it and had experience doing it. So it's important that, you know, you know who they are, you have some familiarity of, you know, how they operated before if things didn't go wrong and making sure they're not going to cause you a problem in the future. So I recommend getting references from other companies um understanding you know who they are also from a relationship perspective you're gonna have to work with these people for a while so i recommend you know getting along with them making sure you have a good relationship with you know directors in the company investors around the table all of these things are important uh, next slide so the, the last couple of slides here we're just giving you an understanding of size of market uh and how things are happening what's going on right now uh it's something really hard to predict exactly because it's not as uh, as public as as when people raise equity rounds, but this graph on the left here shows the rapid growth in venture debt in Osh in um, in the US. Obviously, a way way bigger um, venture community, but typically what you're seeing is about 10 to 15 percent of overall venture financing comes in the form of debt, and about 25 percent of later stage financing. So you can see here, there's about three billion um, US dollars of venture debt in um, in 2019. Oh, sorry. 3,000 deals and 25 billion of venture debt. So it's so much larger, I'm saying. So it's significantly, you know, big market. And you can see the rapid growth. Uh, 2020 is still yet to be seen given given what's going on. But this was data as of as of end of April. Uh, in Australia, you know, way, way, way smaller than this. I think last year, there was about 2 billion uh, Aussie dollars of venture capital equity financing. If you look at, you know, and try and size it off a similar uh, metric, Maybe right now there's probably potential for 150 to 300 million Australian dollars of, of venture debt, but I wouldn't say that's right now. And reason being is it's still fairly immature. People are still trying to gain an understanding of the product and how it fits. And as the sophistication of um, investors and management uh, in this product develops, people may be more comfortable and it will slowly grow. So I see no reason why it wouldn't grow over time. Uh, next slide. This one here just looks at Australia specifically. So you can see that rapid growth in, in venture capital equity on the left. Uh, it's really been growing quite fast. Um, right now, obviously, given, given COVID-19 and, and you know, recessionary impact, um, there's a lot of uncertainty in market. You know, there's low consumer and business sentiment. There's been a drying up of capital and investors are being way, way more selective in terms of who they're supporting and often supporting their existing portfolio. And there's also, you know, it's hard to, set this yet but there's ex expectation there'll be some falling valuations in certain spaces so in terms of venture debt can be very attractive because like i was saying before it gives you access to capital that can be access today or it could be access in the future and so having access to that money is really helpful to make sure that you can you know grow your business and continue on a, on a good trajectory uh, it avoids um the elephant in the room what i mean by that is valuation so you're not setting that valuation so it can be an attractive complementary product to a convertible loan or or you may have raised equity recently and you want to top it up with some debt. And because it's cheaper than equity as well, um, it can help improve that overall return to shareholders in a market which is a little bit more tough. And just next slide. And this is the final slide here, just to say that, you know, this product is very, very well used globally. There's many large tech companies here um, which have taken on a product like uh, like ours, you know, the likes of Google, Amazon, Uber, even Australia, uh, Aconex, WiseTech have taken similar debt products. So it's, it's not something which is very niche, it's very well used globally. So that brings the presentation to a close. Uh, so we can just jump into some questions for everyone. Thanks, Nick. Uh, that was so comprehensive, you stole uh, some of my um, stole some of my questions. Um, <laughs> Hi, James. Welcome to the uh, presentation. Good to Thanks, see you. Rick. You look like you're in the middle of a snowstorm there. <laughs> <laughs> Must be where all the lights coming from. Morning, it wasn't. <laughs> um, I, might, I might kick us off with a question. And I uh, once again, for those of you that weren't on the line earlier, if you could just uh, put your question, of which I'm sure there are many burning, um, onto the chat and just identify yourself, who, who you are and where you're from um, alongside your question. That'd, that'd be great. And I'll uh, curate that to the speakers today. And please make the most of the fact that we've got their undivided attention for the next um, 15 minutes. Um, 
you just answered one of the questions that I had about the maturity of um, the market for venture debt. I think you uh, did that very nicely, so I won't ask that. But have you actually changed your lending criteria to uh, to the current market given uh, COVID-19? No, I mean, ultimately, look, we're, we're being more cautious and making sure we're trying to assess the risks in current market, but we're very much, you know, active and looking at deals. Um, would even be willing to look at deals in you know in trickier spaces as well. So we're looking at something right now in travel, and the key is making sure that business is sustainable and and can survive through the period. I mean, ultimately, we all feel that travel is going to come back, hospitality is going to come back, things going to open again. It's really a question of timing and how that impacts the ability to raise funding. So we're being a little bit more cautious, uh, making sure businesses have sufficient runway so they're not operating on very short time periods. But definitely, like we're not. We're not suddenly saying we're not we're not open or we're charging more money. Ultimately, we, we want to make sure the business is you know, performing and we structure the, the loan accordingly. Yeah. OK. OK. Um, and what about uh, what? So suppose that I want to um, take a venture credit loan. What what would I expect to have to pay up front to put to put it in place? Sure. James. Don't, don't... Yeah, sure. And let's go for the hard questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Everyone wants to know about costs. So, um, just by the way, as as Nick said before, I work in the team with him, been at One Ventures four years. Uh, uh, to set up uh, the loan, we normally do a small transaction fee of one or two percent. So it's not it's not really very much to to set it up, and we usually require the business to commit to drawing at least some of the money down because there's a cost for us to keeping the money available for them. But aside from that. That's the all the costs. It's quite small. Yeah, legal fees aren't too expensive either. Like, there's obviously some legal, legal costs. Fees. Yeah, but. Okay. And so, what about you know my uh, reg tech business is operating in, um, and maybe it's a dot 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 uh, some kind of challenged industry at the moment. And and the example I was given was aviation, but it it could be another industry that we could think of at the moment that's being a bit challenged. Um, would we still be able to? access the funding right now so using aviation as an example let's say i was a reg tech in that space how would that impact things yeah sure so i can take it um i think it look obviously it makes it trickier being in a, in a tougher space and i suppose you're going to get some more scrutiny around around the long-term viability of a business but you know even aviation ultimately look domestic travel should hopefully come back soon so if your business operating in australia domestic aviation you know Right now is a better time than it was, for, you know, two three months ago. So I think we take a view on how that business looks. What's the funding base of that business? Um, where is it? Where is it targeting within that space? But definitely, we're you know, like I said, we're looking at stuff in in travel right now, uh, which is clearly tough as well. But but we're open minded. So. Um, and so, what happens if things go wrong? What happens if things go wrong, and uh, you know, the tide turns against us? Uh, will I trip a covenant if I don't hit my forecasts? James, do you want to take it? Yeah, <laughs> I give James so, giving you I all think, the hard questions. I think that it's fine. No, it's a really important question, a question that everyone wants to know. I think the most important thing to know is that once we hand over the money to a startup that doesn't really have much in the way of assets, like some laptops and some chairs and desks, that's really it. There's not. There's no way we could really take the money back. And even if we wanted to take the money back or sell the business, there's there's no business without the founders, right? Like it's intellectual capital, it's relationships. Um, yeah. So we are really looking to work with the business to find a solution. This isn't the, in the instance where they trip a covenant because they can't pay the loan. If they trip a small covenant, then we normally just, you know, they forget to send us something and we just work that out. It's just, they just send us the document and we don't worry about it. Yeah. But if they're really struggling to pay the loan, then we, we work with them and say, you know, what are we going to need as a solution here? Either the investors are going to have to put in more money to keep us going longer, or uh, we're going to have to cut our costs, or we're going to have to, you know, pivot to different strategy. But it's all going to be very collaborative because the only way we're really getting our money back is if the business succeeds and, and does well. And there's no you know, it's not like the bank taking your house, there's an asset there. Like there's really not an asset with a startup except the business potential. Right. And, and you mentioned as part of the conversation that you kind of like touch in terms of investor report, normal investor reporting requirements. So how would that, uh, like, so how does, how does that actually look in practical terms? So you take an observer seat on the board? Yeah, so we take an observer seat on the board, which is really the easiest way for us to get all the information 
we need. So we don't ask them to do any, you know, bank line us for uh, documents to be like financial documents to provided them in the bank's format, right? With all these check boxes or government money might have, you know, similar kind of requirements. We just say whatever you send to the board, which is normally board decks and, and numbers. Uh, and we just sit in on the board or call in on the board call, like somebody's calling into this call and just kind of hear the update, business update, what's going on. And that keeps us super light, but also super informed. And when we're more informed, it's better for everyone because then we're more comfortable and then we're more able to help as well. Yeah. And I guess one of the points you were making earlier too is about you want this actually to potentially be a longer relationship. Right, so beyond the venture credit line, then there's potential for equity. So making that relationship, and if there was one thing that I learned from being um, in venture capital and private equity for nearly a decade, one of the things I learned is this is is about relationships and you know the long term relationships that you have with everybody on that journey. Um, is there something that you'd like to say to that? Yeah, I mean, relationship is is super important. Like we come at this from being a you know a venture capital firm. You know, we understand that the key thing here is that, you know, earlier stage tech businesses aren't, it's not a straight line journey. It's always ups and downs. And that's that's really, really important. Um, you know, we understand that risk. We understand how things change. And that, that's kind of the reason we want the board observer as well. So we want to be close and understand what's happening. Sometimes you can't necessarily see that from a monthly set of numbers. Yes. Therefore, making sure that business is on that right trajectory, we can help, you know, we can give experience from from you know, what we've experienced before and help founders through that journey. Um, and that's really, really important because that helps us being able to provide a loan which is more flexible and has less restrictions because we can be close and understand what's going on. So to James's point before, you know, if if it's going through troubling times, it doesn't suit us at all to turn around and say, pay us the money back because one, the company is probably burning money and therefore can't pay us back. But yeah. Two, breaking up doesn't do anything. So having that relationship and being able to help through the journey means we're, very aligned to founders and other shareholders and want the business to drive value. So that's kind of, it's really, really important. Yeah. So is there anything specific um, uh, that one should be aware of if you want to raise or go offshore, like you're taking on some venture, are there any impacts? No, I mean, we're really happy to lend. So what we want to do, we're, we're targeting Australia and Kiwi businesses, first and foremost, that's kind of a, a key focus, but many of our businesses, you know, if not virtually all of them, We'll have some operations overseas and we'll probably grow over time. We'll become less and less Australians, even more and more global. Yes. Completely fine. So we're happy for businesses to grow any direction they want. Um, we can manage security to make sure we're comfortable, but you can't just suddenly push all the money into another country and, and see you later. So we want to make sure we're structured so it works. But ultimately, we want the business to go overseas. Like they all go overseas. And if I take my experience from Europe, uh, my previous firm, you know, businesses are in five, ten countries from very, very early on in their in their life, yeah. um, which is something we're more likely to take a view on than maybe a bank will, because it might become more tricky for a bank to manage overseas risk. Yes, yes. But no issue at all. So if that's if that's trading overseas and having overseas customers, or raising offshore money, yes. or even flipping to the US at some point, which a lot of businesses do, it's perfectly fine. We can manage that. Great. Um, so I'm going to give everybody on the line just uh, a minute or two uh, to think about that burning question that they want to ask. Can I at least have one? That, that'd be grand. But what I thought I'd do is actually go to each of you in turn and um, ask you for a final thought. What's the question that you don't get asked that you should get asked? Um, or what, you know, what, what's your final thought? Um, given that you know a little bit about um, the reg tech industry based on what I've um, how I've briefed you and things. So maybe a final thought from the speakers and I'll wait for a question. And if we don't get to a question, then hallelujah, we get to um, finish um, a few minutes early and get everybody back to their day. Sure, happy to, happy to start if you want. Um, I think the final thought is really around um, just happy like for us it's about building relationships over long term so you may not be at the right stage straight away but it's always important to kind of there's no harm in reaching out and building a relationship over time um you know we're not rigid rigid in terms of it must fit even though we have criteria you know if certain things are very strong but something else you're slightly too small or something's not exactly fitting in the box we can take a view um it's always good to kind of i'd say be prepared and therefore have those relationships early is important um it makes it easier for us, but also easier for you that you're not kind of up against a wall. But often people think, I must look like this before I speak to people. But with us in the same way as a VC fund, like knowing that journey is important as well.
Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I, I, I typed that in there so that we've got that for um, uh, we've got that in front of us. Uh, what about you, James? Um, I think for specifically to the reg tech industry, um, you know, we've done a lot of stuff, and I just people should know that we've done a lot of stuff in like wholesale financing of loan books, uh, and people have um, capital they have to sometimes hold against uh, uh, having a bank facility have to hold capital. We've done, we've looked at, you know, loans against that. So I think don't just think of it necessarily as a simple loan. Like if you're in this in the fintech, which is a little crossover with the reg tech industry. Um, uh, if you just think, if you think you need money for it, then debt might work as well. It's not necessarily um, what will come to mind, but if you're gonna say, oh, I need equity for this, or I need a shareholder loan for that, then venture debt can be applicable too. And finally, Nigel, where we started. Yeah, well, my final thought is very much around the, um, you know, don't forget this is a long relationship and, you know, a fund like ours uh, has lots of people with very different experience that can partner up with you and provide you with advice. Uh, and, you know, it's a, a journey in, with debt and equity and we're able to offer offer a wide range of alternatives and certainly alternative views on on the ways forward so please don't hesitate to ask if there's uh, anything that we've said that uh, has uh, tickled your interest um so i do venture capital this is uh, from kate weber um who's from the rfi group who uh, publish australian Institute, uh, australian banking and finance uh, venture capital still seems underway in Australia despite COVID-19, but smaller deals with less backing. Uh, do you think this will continue post-COVID-19? Um, yeah, I think venture capital in Australia definitely is still young and it's it's had massive growth in recent years. I mean, there's a number of large funds who've raised money in the last 12 months. So that, that puts a really good standing in terms of there's a lot of dry capital out there to invest. Um, there's also there's a whole long tail of different investors in Australia. So I think in terms of the point now, smaller, smaller deals, definitely there's lots of high net worth family offices who are investing into the space um, and non-traditional investors. So I think that will continue. Clearly, there's, you know, some cautiousness uh, given market, but it's great to see if Australia is, you know, hopefully bouncing back from COVID-19 quicker than a lot of other countries. So that should put our VC industry in better stead than some others, I think. Yeah, I think I'd just add that I'm not sure I've seen deal size actually, you know, any particular trend in, in deal size change since since the current crisis. Uh, you know, so it was a little bit hard to make those kind of measures because it's it's actually still quite a small market. Um, and I think it's more of a watch this space. I think people have been obviously being cautious uh, for the last few months, but I think the, the next few might be quite different. Fantastic. Um, so we might um, just wrap it up there, but... Um, we're uh, going to share the um, deck, as I understand it, which will have your contact details. So if people need to contact you, I, I didn't actually check, but I assume the contact details are on there so people know how they can get in touch. Um, that's great. Um, so thank you very much to Nigel, Nick and James for that. I think, um, you know, the I really appreciated the education uh, piece in part of that it was actually quite important to show um, you know, to, to, to show more information about what venture credit is about and where it fits in uh, alongside equity. Very important for our people to understand that. And I was enlightened on a couple of things um, in relation to, you know, where Australia sits in terms of the rest of the world and the fact um, that it's actually quite light touch in the term in terms of investor reporting. Um, so I'd, uh, if, if we could all clap you, we would. Um, but since we can't, I will clap you and say thank you very much. And just before we finish off, I wanted to um, let people know what's next in our series. Um, we will have our next RegTech Showcase event on this Thursday, which is actually a showcase of uh, digital identity and KYC uh, technologies. So for those VCs um, on the line, you might be interested to pop in and have a bit of a look at that. We've got, um, I think, five great uh, companies presenting. Um, each over a uh, five-minute presentation each. Um, then on the 25th of June, we'll have our next showcase, which is all um, focused on uh, people risks. 
Um, and then we've got we're we're actually actively every fortnight we'll be running another one of those, and then weekly um, weekly sessions just like this, full of tools, tips, and resources. And if you haven't already marked your diaries, please do so for Accelerate Reg Tech 2021, which has been scheduled in Sydney for the 18th of March, and there'll be more information about that to follow. And for those of you who are on the line and want to explore uh, joining our association, you'll see a little bit of a, a slide there showing our growth from uh, December 2018 to where we are now, 150 organisations all committed to accelerating adoption of reg tech and to underpin, you know, a, a global centre of excellence. Um, so please come along, uh, reach out to us and join us. We would love to have you and there's the information on our website. So without further ado, I'll sign off now and uh, say thanks once again for attending and thank you to our presenters. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.